Uh, again, welcome to, to ask the questions, even in the middle of the presentation. So if, if you have a question, so please either raise your hand or write something to the chat box. Or if we don't uh, notice that immediately, so then you are, of course, also available to open the mic and ask the question. But please go ahead, up. the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, it's very nice to give a talk for this audience after being away for quite a while. Of course, the, uh, the circumstances are a little bit uh, unusual with the Zoom and stuff. But anyway, so yes, I will be talking about nonlinear independent component analysis. As uh, most many people in the audience will know, I have been working on independent component analysis for quite a while. Uh, but usually linear. But so now it is all going nonlinear, uh, which is highly exciting and deep, as we will see. So I will start with a short introduction to deep learning and emphasize then the importance of unsupervised learning or unsupervised deep learning. Uh, in particular, people have been using the buzzword disentanglement uh, to express something where you try to find some kind of independent factors of your data in an unsupervised way. And in fact, this is exactly what ICA or independent component analysis does in the linear case. So then the question is, how can we extend, extend that theory into a nonlinear case, in nonlinear methods? Well, the problem is that nonlinear ICA is, well, it's, of, it's kind of obvious perhaps that it's a much dif more difficult problem. And in particular, it is fundamentally ill-defined in the sense that the components are not identifiable. Uh, I will, of course, define that term a bit later. It's very important in this talk. So then I will propose a couple of solutions that we have been, uh, we have found out um, just within the last five years or so. First, uh, one solution is to use the temporal structure of the time series. Actually, there are two different kinds of temporal structure that we might use. Second, we can use, we have a more general framework where we have observed some kind of an auxiliary variable such as, for example, audio data for when we want to do uh, ICA on video. And well, so uh, those are kind of the uh, assumptions that we make on the data. So of the probabilistic model, if you like, of the data. But then we, of course, have to develop various kinds of estimation methods. And we, I'm basically talking about here of two different kinds. First, those based on self-supervised learning and those based on uh, the va uh, variational autoencoder. Okay, so first uh, I have a couple of slides as a kind of a very simple introduction to uh, neural networks and so on. I will go through them very quickly, assuming that most of you know a lot of this. But okay, we all know the success of artificial intelligence with all kinds of fancy applications, uh, <coughs> robots, game playing, uh, search engines, and so on. And most of these modern applications really are based on deep learning. So what is deep learning? Deep learning is basically the same as using neural networks, where a neural network is essentially a method for uh, general approximation of functions. Um, it can gener uh, basically can approximate highly uh, general functions even in high dimensional spaces. So ba it's based on a kind of a hierarchical structure where each layer in a network basically takes a, makes a linear transformation of its inputs and then those go through some uh, scale nonlinear additives. For example, this famous uh, rare loop nonlinear additive. Um, and okay, so that neural networks are basically fundamentally a method for approximating functions. But then you combine that with learning uh, by introducing various kinds of statistical objectives, for example, a least squares criterion for regression. So when people talk about deep learning, then basically they, are to they mean that, first of all, they have a neural network. And then it has many layers, why they call, which is why they call it deep. And then there's supposed to be some kind of learning happening there. So the idea being that, well, uh, if you have just enough data, you can basically learn any kind of an arbitrary input-output relationship. For example, you input images and the neural network outputs categories, recognizing what is in the image, or it can predict the future when you input the past and say that the target is the present. And you can take Facebook stuff where you have predict somebody's political views from uh, the set of his or her friends. So the present boom was basically studied by this famous paper by Krzyzewski, Sutskever and Hinton in 2012, where they were doing like object recognition in images. 
So it can tell the neural network learned to tell that this here in this picture, there's a car, in this picture, there's mushrooms and even more detailed information. Okay, but that is all basically supervised learning in the sense that you need category labels. So you have input like images, for example, and then the outputs, the desired outputs or targets, like what is in the image? Is it a cat or a dog or whatever? But it may be that these kind of labels are very difficult to obtain. You may need like human annotation. Humans may need to actually tell you what is in the images or what, whatever the target may be. And that may be very expensive. And it, there are also many cases where the A labels are simply very difficult to get. You, or you may get some labels, but they are not particularly informative, maybe very noisy and so on. So this brings us to the question of uh, unsupervised learning. So what if we only observe a data vector X, typically assumed to be uh, mod, uh, well, typically formalized as a random vector X, many uh, multidimensional random vector, but you have no label or no any target Y. So you just input these X's to a neural network, but you don't know what the output should be like. For example, you have just photographs, but no labels, no information about what is in the photographs. And unsupervised learning is basically a very, very difficult problem, much more difficult than supervised learning. I think everybody agrees on that. And it's also largely an unsolved problem. I gave a, a talk in the colloquium a couple of weeks ago, or maybe a month ago, where I was talking about the fact that, well, there's many different kinds of, actually, I think you can divide unsupervised learning into many different kinds of problems, many different subfields. Uh, well, I will not go into those details. This time, I will just talk about one particular thing, which is independent component analysis. So to introduce ICA, well, I'll go back in history to so linear ICA, which was a subject of intense research by many people, including myself, in like um, around 2000, or just, well, in the 90s and around a, a bit after 2000 as well. So the idea is that, well, we have, we observe, so we have a, a multidimensional random vector, which is here, well, here we denote it by x i k, where i is the index of the variable, k is a sample index, so the index of the observation. And we want to express that as the date observed data as a linear, trans, linear uh, superposition of certain latent variables Sj. So uh, the Sj's are latent variables. They are kind of like targets, but they are unobserved. Uh, and the Aij's are here now the, uh, the what are called the mixing coefficients or the, the kind of parameters that basically tell you how the observations are related to the uh, to these latent variables, and the uh, basic assumption here is that these latent variables are not only independent, as the name says, but also they are non-Gaussian. Based on this idea of non-Gaussianity, together with independence, we actually get a rather surprising theory uh, theorem, which is that this model is identifiable. That means it is well defined in the sense that when you only observe these X's, then you can actually recover both the A's and the S's. So this is actually, well, this was kind of a, became famous after Common published a paper on that in 94 in the context of ICA, but actually it goes back to old, uh, uh, old uh, probabilistic theory by Darmois and Skitovic around 19, 1950. So this is in, in stark contrast to things like PCA or classical factor analysis, where you basically assume that the data is Gaussian. So now when you make the assumption of non-Gaussianity, then you actually get identifiability, while in the Gaussian case, you don't actually have any identifiability. So this is actually shown uh, here on this slide. So here we have a distribution of two independent components. And here we have, uh, we show the distribution of the observed mixtures. Now, if we do something like PCA, it will not actually be able to get the original components. It will, in fact, get some kind of a rotation of them. But then when you get to do ICA, you will actually get the original components. So, and this is really based on the non-Gaussianity. Kind of intuitively, the non-Gaussianity is seen in the fact that here the distribution forms a very nice square. And so it's intuitively plausible that, well, somehow analyzing the data, you can actually find the original 
original square like I see it as. Um, yeah, okay, well, I will skip that. So, um, <clears throat> so what identifiability means in practice is that it can uh, that ICA can do something like uh, something that is called lines of separation. So here we have we assume that the data so we take data which is basically consisting of these four signals. So it's it's a four dimensional signal. These are all observed together. Now if we do PCA, we don't actually get anything meaningful. But when we do ICA, we actually find that these comp these observed signals were actually created as a linear superposition, a linear mixture of these original sources, and they are recovered by ICA, but not PC. So this kind of an approach has many applications. Of course, one of the most successful ones is uh, in, uh, in neuroscience, where you can do, where you can basically separate brain signals. So this is using, uh, this here is an example, I will not go into details of using MEG, which is kind of a, an improved version of EG where you basically divide brain activity measured outside of the brain uh, into nine interesting uh, components. You can also do image feature extraction uh, by the same model, but that's a slightly different thing. Uh, maybe I will not go into details here for the, because I don't have a lot of time. Okay, but so what we would really like to do is to do the same thing in the nonlinear case. So that's how we would get a, a method for general disentanglement, as people tend to call it these days. But now we run into this problem of identifiability. If the problem is not identifiable, it simply means that we cannot actually get the original components. That's the basic meaning. And that is ex exactly what happens if we simply define a nonlinear ICA model completely straightforwardly by replacing the linear mixing by a nonlinear mixing. So we say that each of the observed random variables is some arbitrary nonlinear function of independent components S1 to Sn. Uh, we kind of revived that proof of non-identifiability in 99, but again, it kind of goes back to Darmois uh, around 1950, the same Darmois. So here's an illustration. <clears throat> so we have, again, two independent components. Uh, and here's a scatter plot of the data, and the color here is purely for the purposes of illustration. Now we can take a nonlinear mixture of these two random variables, and we get something like we can get, for, for example, something like this, which is clearly a very nonlinear thing. Uh, and we can actually get, by a certain method I will explain next, we can get two components which are exactly independent and have exactly the same distributions as the original data, uh, sorry, as the original latent variables. But clearly, these components here are not at all the same as the components here, as you can also see by, especially you can see that by the color coding, there is no real match between that in the original sources and the estimates. So what happens? He said, okay, Dagmar actually showed, uh, uh, proposed a constructive method that shows the impossibility or ill-definedness or unidentifiability of nonlinear ICA. So uh, the construction goes as follows. Assume we have two random variables, x1 and x2. What he showed is that you can always construct a nonlinear function, g, of x1 and x2, such that the output of this function, denoted by y, is independent of x1. That is actually obtained by simply taking the conditional cumulative distribution function of x2 given x1. Now, this is because, well, as you may know, when you input, put, when you put a random variable through its cumulative distribution function, it will have a uniform distribution. Now, here, what we are saying is that conditionally on x1, x2 should always have a uniform distribution. What that means is that the distribution of x2 does not depend on x1 anymore, and that is the very definition of statistical independence. So now, <clears throat> using this, this construction here, what it means is that we could simply say that x1 is one independent component because we can have another, func another variable y, which is independent of that. But that is, of course, completely absurd, saying that one of the observed variables necessarily has to be one of the independent components, one of the latent variables. So that shows that the, the, the problem is, is, is ill-defined 
and the components are not identifiable. Well, maybe you need a little bit more thinking to prove that it's unidentifiable, but that's the basic idea. Now, in, uh, in, in the case of uh, 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 linear ICA, non-Gaussianity is, of course, a very important concept. As I said, that's kind of the key to having identifiability. But it's easy to see that in the nonlinear case, non-Gaussianity has kind of no meaning at all, because if you just make, you can always make any, some nonlinear transformation H of X1 uh, to obtain, so that this transformation has any distribution you ever like, as non-Gaussian as you like. So non-Gaussianity in itself cannot have any, any uh, utility here either. So the nonlinear case is very different, much more difficult from uh, compared to the linear case. And in fact, the, the illustration I, I showed on the previous slide with the sources, the mixtures and the estimates was exactly obtained by this uh, construction by, by that one. Okay, but um, there's no need to despair. Maybe there was need to despair in the last century, but now we actually know that there are solutions. Well, because the theory above actually so, uh, considered simply random variables. That is, we ha only have, with the, what, the only thing we actually know is, is the marginal distribution of, of X. So it is as if the data were IID sampled from some random variable or some, some random variable. But if, of course, if we, we can have something like time series, where we actually have temporal structure, not IID samples, and that may change things. And in fact, it does. Uh, Harmeling and others in 2003 were kind of the first to show by simulations without any theory that it seems that you can actually recover uh, nonlinear components in this case. So what they assumed is that the nonlinear, so the component, so, sorry, they assumed that independent components have autocorrelations, something, so they have structure, something like this. Uh, now, actually, there's different kinds of temporal structure, obviously. We proposed, uh, like a few years ago, as our first IC, nonlinear IC approach, that the components might have non stationarity, which means basically that, well, for example, it could mean that the components are such that they are kind of uh, uh, non active as uh, part of the, at, 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 in some time segments. And then in some time segments, they actually have a lot of activity. Uh, activity meaning something like variance. So in this case, actually, identifiability of nonlinear ICA can be proven. That's kind of one basic idea for most of the rest of this talk. And that means that we can actually find the original sources even in nonlinear mixtures if we have, if the latent variables have suitable temporal structure. So um, I will be using uh, in much of this talk an algorithmic talk, uh, algorithmic trick called self-supervised learning. Now, there's no logical reason why we should use self-supervised learning. It's just like one possible algorithmic approach, but it's it's completely kind of independent or orthogonal, if you like, to the question of identifiability and temporal structure. But it's a it's an algorithmic trick that has actually grown extremely popular recently, and well. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of, well, for, for reasons that may become clear later. So what self-supervised learning, what it means is that, okay, let's recall the idea of supervised learning. In supervised learning, we have inputs, such as images, and we have output, such as labels of what is in the images. In unsupervised learning, we only have input X. Now, self-supervised learning, what it means is that we actually only have the input X but then we invent this Y ourselves somehow, just kind of artificially. For example, we can, we can well, this, this, is, this is something that you do in a completely intuitive way. There's no theoretical principle for doing it, especially with images. It turns out that people have, a, with their imagination, they can, uh, they can figure out all different kinds of methods. Uh, one, one thing the case is that you may create some kind of a corrupted data in various ways, but I, I, I will not go into, into much details. But then the point is that once you have invented your Y, then you use supervised algorithms to, uh, with this X and your, your invented Y, and then perhaps you find some interesting structure in your data. So as a very simple illustration, so this is extremely popular in computer vision, as a very simple illustration, 
Suppose you have photographs and you just like remove part of the photograph, maybe like a, a square in the center. And then you learn to predict that missing part from the remaining part. So then presumably your neural network or whatever you use has to learn something about the structure of the data in order to, um, to uh, accomplish this uh, artificially defined task. So it's a method for, it's, it's plausible that this kind of a method finds interesting features which is the main idea, main, main, uh, uh, main purpose in computer vision. So we started our research on nonlinear ICA uh, kind of accidentally. Um, I just proposed a, a method for self-supervised learning without actually knowing the whole term self-supervised. It wasn't really popular at that time yet. Uh, and then it turned out to do nonlinear ICA. So the point was the following. Suppose we have an n-dimensional time series. I was actually thinking of these brain measurements like MEG. What we could do is that we divide this uh, time series into a number of segments. Uh, as a simple case, as the, as the basic case, you just take bins with equal sizes, equal number of time points in each uh, segment. And then you train a multi-layer perception that is a neural network to tell which segment each single data point comes from. So it's a very classical classification task. The input data points are exactly the same data points as we observed originally. But now we have defined these class labels, which are equal to the indices of the segments. And then you just train a multinomial logistic regression using completely uh, well-known well -known theory of uh, neural networks and multinomial logistic regression. So then what you get in your neural network is that you have first some kind of a feature extractor which is basically up, uh, everything up to the last hidden layer. And then you have some coefficients that actually turn that into a multinomial logistic regression. Now, if you think about what this kind of a system should be learning, it has to learn to represent the non-stationarity of, the, of the, your data in the last hidden layer. Because non-stationarity by definition is nothing else than the difference between the uh, difference of the distributions between the segments. So that is exactly what it has to learn to be able to tell which data, which segment each data point comes from. But there's actually no, well, now uh, thinking that this could actually do nonlinear ICA sounds like completely wishful thinking. There's no logical reason why it should happen. And actually it was kind of a great surprise to me that you can actually prove that this thing, this kind of a system does nonlinear ICA under, under certain constraints. So we have a theorem. <clears throat> we assume that the data follows the nonlinear ICA model. We always assume in this kind of line of research that the data actually follows the model, where so the X is some nonlinear transformation of latent variables, where the mixing, mixing function F is kind of completely arbitrary, except that it is invertible and has some smoothness properties. And now importantly, we assume that the components are non-stationary. For example, they could have this kind of a bursts in variance as I showed in a previous uh, slide. And then we assume that we apply time contrastive learning that I just described on this data using a multi-layer perceptron on your network where the hidden layer has the same number of units as last hidden layer has the same number of units as observed uh, data, which is actually the number of uh, observed um, the data variables equals the number of uh, latent variables. Then what we can prove is that TCL will actually find, uh, it will converge so that the squares of the original components are equal to some linear transformation of the outputs of the hidden layers, where the squaring is, is like element-wise. So what it basically means is that TCL kind of demixes the nonlinear ICA model up to a linear mixing. So it, it solves the nonlinear ICA problem up to a, a linear mixing. But then of course this linear mixing can under certain uh, assumptions be estimated by ordinary linear ICA. So the only thing that's kind of uh, rests undetermined is this squaring. Now, if you wonder why it is squaring, it is actually, um, Oh, sorry, I, I'm, I'm missing one word on this slide. Um, I'm assuming in this particular version, I'm assuming that the data is Gaussian, Gaussian where non with uh, non-stationary variance. So the squaring comes from the Gaussian um, 
uh, log uh, probability density function. In general, it would be some other scalar function. So we have proven that TCL finds the components up to some simple non uh, indeterminacy. So that is actually at the same time a constructive proof of the identifiability of the model itself. So even if you don't like this, this uh, algorithm, and we actually have uh, many alternatives to this algorithm, we are, well, the main thing here is perhaps that we have actually proven the identifiability of the model. So we have shown that the, the, added, the model, uh, the whole estimation problem is solvable. Now, uh, if you think, want to have an intuitive explanation of why this might work, well, you can think of it in the following way. Um, this logic here does not follow the self-supervised learning. This is just kind of a, a more abstract, abstract, abstract logic. Now, when we have non-stationary data, we can basically say that the components that you obtain should be independent at every segment, even in principle at every time point. So you actually get many, more, many, many more constraints than in ordinary ICA, where you would just say that the components, their global distribution, has to, they have to be independent. So you get many more constraints, and that is why it's plausible that you actually get a unique solution. Okay. So uh, then we continued on this line of research, kind of using our imagination to figure out other kinds of uh, self-supervised learning methods. So self-supervised learning methods are kind of fun that you just use kind of completely intuitive, uh, intuitive logic to find all kinds of uh, imaginary, imaginary labels that you might impose on your data. Uh, imaginary kind of a kind of uh, kind of uh, com uh, kind of artificial artificial supervised learning problems, and sometimes it turns out that they actually do something useful. So we were kind of lucky, in the sense that it was kind of easy to to figure out another self supervised learning method that also does something like nonlinear ICA. Now, in particular, so I said earlier that okay, we can have non stationarity. Uh, maybe I should go back here. That we can have non-stationarity as the temporal structure, or we can have autocorrelations. In particular, autocorrelations that would be uh, together with uh, assumption of stationarity, autocorrelated stationary uh, uh, components. So, what about this case of stationary time series? Can we do something useful with self-supervised learning? Okay, well, actually we can. So we propose the following. So we take short time windows as a kind of a new data set. In the very simplest case, we just take two subsequent time points, xt and xt minus one. And then we create another data set where we have also two time points, but in completely random point, uh, random, random places. Uh, so we, uh, it's a data set where we have the same marginal distributions, but we have completely destroyed the, uh, the temporal structure. And so what we can then do is that we can train a neural network to discriminate between these two, uh, these two data sets. Now, kind of surprisingly, again, it's actually very surprising that under certain, uh, certain architectural constraints, you can actually show that this kind of a system will perform nonlinear ICA when you have temporally dependent, for example, autocorrelated components in, in a stationary, stationary time series. Okay, and we have actually a theorem that shows the convergence and the identifiability. So this is actually, we, this is a different probabilistic model. So we have to show the identifiability for this one. And again, we are showing it by showing that this algorithm is able to find the components. I will not show the theorem. I will just show uh, an example. So here we have data which follows a non-Gaussian autoregressive model. So the, uh, the latent variables follow a non-Gaussian autoregressive model where basically the innovations are, have Laplacian distributions. And this is exactly the data that I showed earlier. We have sources, uh, two sources with distributions colored for the purposes of illustration, and then we have the mixtures. And so I showed earlier that the Dagmar construction shows that you can get independent components, which are not at all the original independent components, but that was ignoring the temporal structure. So now we use PCL that I just described, and we actually get a pretty good estimate of the original components, looking at just the color coding and so on. Of course, some estimation errors or maybe local minima in the neural network or something. 
while if we have look at this original method by Harmeling and others, it doesn't give you very good estimates of the components actually. So their method was purely heuristic and well, it was actually kind of clear how you can kill the method by choosing certain distributions. And this is of course what we did here. Okay, we have various extensions, but I don't have time to go into those. Let, I will just briefly mention another gen, uh, uh, last general framework that we have been working on. Now we are going uh, not now, um, which which is at the same time going kind of beyond the time series context and at the same time going out of the self-supervised learning context. So we look at the more general framework of deep latent variable models, which can be actually seen as a generalization of ICA in a certain way. This is how it is usually presented in the literature, but it's kind of just very much like ICA. We have here, we have some components, some measurement equation. Um, yeah, and actually in practice, when people define these, uh, define these quantities, they end up with something like ICA. In fact, people, uh, this is widely used in, uh, in the form of a variational autoencoder, where basically people define the measurement equation like this, which is like ICA, uh, but then you add, add some noise as well. And then people, what people usually do is also they define the, uh, the distribution of the components so that they are independent and Gaussian. Now, this is absolutely non-identifiable. People have been using these VAEs a lot. Uh, but they have been actually a lot of people have been making the same mistake that people used to do with classical factor analysis. They just somehow hope that the model is identifiable, even though it is not at all. We can actually show that in, in, in various ways using the data construction or even using the properties of uh, Gaussian variables. So, what we proposed is kind of a conditioning version of that. We assume that there's some other variable u which modulates the distributions of the independent components. This is, for example, um, this was heuristically, the same idea was proposed earlier by Arangelovic and Zisserman, where they wanted to find image features. And so they took video data, and then they basically had audio uh, that goes with the video. And so they were taking audio data as this kind of a modulating or conditioning variable that then helps you get, find better components uh, better features in your video data. Now we can actually show that this provides a kind of a generalization of our framework of the time, uh, the time contrastive and permutation contrastive learning. Uh, and it also provides a generalization. We can also, so, so we can also integrate it in the, in the context of the VAEs. So, well, I'm kind of running out of time, but I will just briefly mention that, well, we, we, uh, we proposed a method called IVAE, uh, as in identifiable VAE, where the idea is that now these dis distributions of the latent variables are only conditionally independent given these U's, which modulate the distribution of your variables. And then we can actually prove identifiability of the model. Here's a simple illustration where we try to recover independent, the original components. And our method here goes very well. Uh, close to 100%, I think, while all the others are, are, are quite bad. So this is, in a, so this is a, a case of nonlinear ICA where we don't necessarily need a time series. It's a more general framework and we don't use self-supervised learning either. We use something, some kind of, something more related to maximum likelihood estimation in a, in a variational approximation framework. Okay, and we have some alternative approaches, but I don't really have time for that. Okay, so <clears throat> let me conclude. So typical deep learning needs something, some kind of targets, outputs for your neural networks, which often are class labels, or they could also be some, you know, future values. Now, if you have no class labels, then we get into this uh, context of uncivilized learning, which is a very difficult problem. Uh, often, uh, as I argued in a, in a previous talk, there's actually many different sub problems. Uh, it's often approached in very heuristic ways also. Now, independent component analysis is really a very principled approach for solving many of the tasks inside of unsupervised learning, in particular finding these uh, original components. 
Now, the point in this talk is that, well, we can actually turn the well-known ideas and the theory of, no, of independent component analysis into the nonlinear case, which can then be used in deep learning. And the key word here really was identifiability. So we, we require, necessarily require, that the models have to be identifiable in the sense that we can recover the original components that actually created the data. And so this is in contrast to uh, classical ideas like PCA or factor analysis in the linear case. And in the deep learning context, it is, it's, it's in contrast to uh, the basic idea of VAE. VAE, in my opinion, actually, is actually, is, is very, very similar. It's, it's, it's really like a nonlinear version of PCA. So we have to change PCA quite a lot in order to actually make it identifiable and to make it into nonlinear ICA. So we need uh, some kind of special assumptions for this identifiability. And we basically proposed here three different options. Either we, have, we can have time series uh, with non-stationarity. This was time contrastive learning. Or we can have time series with temporal dependencies such as autocorrelations. Or in the more general framework, we can have uh, some external auxiliary variable that conditions the components. And that was used in our IBAE. So we used uh, often self-supervised methods. So what I didn't mention is that one, um, one motivation for self-supervised methods is that they are kind of easy to implement because you turn, your, method, turn your, your algorithm into a supervised learning algorithm and there's a huge amount of you know, software and, uh, and, and, and quite all kinds of ready-made packages that you can then use. And um, yeah, so we also made the connection to these uh, deep, um, deep latent variable models uh, underlying, underlying the VAEs. And so kind of the, the kind of a, a selling point here for, uh, in the deep learning context is that it's really a principled framework for disentanglement. Disentanglement is something that people are really interested in these days, but it's usually completely heuristic. And we can prove that the methods actually don't do what they are supposed to do in many cases. But here we have a principle framework and we can prove that the method actually does what it does. Uh, sorry, the method actually does what it's supposed to do, which is the uh, principle of identifiability. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Apo. It was very interesting. And, and there are a lot of questions already in, in the chat box. So, so, so Jyrki and Antti, would you like to, to ask them by yourself or do you want me to, to read the questions here? So, well, if Jyrki wants to start, yeah. A uh, very good talk. Thank you, Apo. Uh, I actually have two questions. Uh, the latent variables S, is there any dimensionality for X? Yeah, so uh, in the basic theory, uh, just like in the linear case, we are assuming that the number of uh, dimension of S is equal to the number of X. That's of course uh, slightly unrealistic, but it basic, it's basically made because it simplifies the theory enormously. It's all, that's why it's even made in the linear case. Okay, good. Now, now in practice, in practice, so uh, in the linear case, what you would usually do in most applications is that you first reduce the dimension of the data by PCA and then do ICA in that reduced dimension, which okay. has a lot of practical utilities like PCA reduces noise and, and, and so on and so on. So you could do the same thing if you like in nonlinear ICA. But also it turns out that these self-supervised methods are particularly practical in the sense that you can just say that the, number, the dimension of the hidden units, number of hidden units is less than the number of offset variables and the methods just work perfectly fine even in that case. And then you can actually afterwards find a theoretical justification for that by saying that some of the components are unidentifiable, don't fool the statistical criteria and so on. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. Can I uh, ask the other question? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, we have, okay. we have a good time. Yeah. What is your own experience of real real data? Are the real measured data often linear or nonlinear in the mixture sense? Right. So. Um, we actually know very little about nonlinear ICA 
on real data. We haven't done too many experiments. That's kind of a one, one missing thing in our theory. Um, um, so, well, I, there, there are cases <clears throat> where it is very clear that you need nonlinear mixtures. Uh, one is in the uh, um, uh, like image feature, feature extraction. Or I mean, you, you can do something with linear eyes here. I, I shouldn't say that you need nonlinear mixtures, but let's say that nonlinear mixtures give you much much more information than linear case. So like linear like feature, uh, image feature extraction. So you can do linear feature extraction uh, by things like wavelets. And in fact, you can do linear ICA and you get something very similar to wavelets. But of course, that's only that with that, you can only do some kind of a uh, low level image processing. It will not get you far if you want to do pattern recognition. But now, so with nonlinear ICA, you could presumably estimate a, long, a big neural network that gives you highly sophisticated features. People have not really done that. There's one paper in archive where they are doing something a little bit in that direction, but I think that that might be like a kind of a killer application of, uh, of nonlinear ICA in some sense. The same applies to, uh, to these brain measurements by EEG or MEG. It's rather clear that, well, if you actually want to find, analyze brain uh, activity in more detail, you need nonlinear features. For one thing, you need to like compute the brain sources. You need to first localize brain sources by a linear, linear filter system. And then you need to take something like amplitudes or perhaps even some nonlinearities calculating the phases or whatever. Uh, so it, it clearly, in, also in that case, a linear analysis is simply uh, insufficient. So, so that's what I, I would say that in, in a, well, well, I suppose the basically what I'm saying is that when you have really complex data, uh, you definitely need nonlinear analysis, uh, but it's, but we don't really have yet uh, like experimental support for that too much. A little bit, a little bit in also in the, in the MEG case actually, but not much. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, and then there's Antti. Uh, oh, okay, sorry, Antti said that he can't use the audio, so then I'll ask Antti's yeah, okay. question. Uh, how sensitive would the nonlinear ICA approaches be to noise in the data? Um, yeah, again, we, we don't really know very much about that kind of uh, stuff, at least from an empirical viewpoint. But in fact, this one, one approach, the uh, IVA approach, has an, a noise model. So it, it is able to model explicitly the noise. So from that key point, actually, we shouldn't have too many problems. OK, good. Thank you. And then, well, there are many, many questions. So it was really interesting. So then I think Ying Tang was, was the next one. Can, can you open the audio? Would you like me to read it? Uh, well, it may be simpler if you just OK, read it. so I'll, I'll read it then, yeah. Uh, so when analyzing a given data set, how to choose choose which method to use, linear or non-linear ICA? Well, I, I suppose the question is that, well, I, I suppose empirically, if I actually had some real data, I would first use linear data anyway, because it's it's very fast, very simple, and you know it's easy, easy, easy to use. There are a lot of software packages, and then I would see what I get out of it. For some case, in some cases, maybe that's enough if the data is kind of reasonably has reasonably simple structure or something. But then, if I want to do some more sophisticated analysis, then I would go into nonlinear ICA. Of course, nonlinear ICA is much much more difficult. For one thing, the theory is still uh, not not that developed, and it's deep learning, so it requires a lot of data, a lot of computation, and so on. Uh, so it can only be used if you, well, if you have a lot of data, a lot of compute, uh, a lot of time, and, and so on and so on. Okay, thank you. And then there's still at least Luigi and Anna. So would you like to start, Luigi? Yeah, yeah. Th thanks for the talk. It was great. Um, yeah, one question. Uh, so do you need to get the distribution right? So you said that you, you need a non-Gaussian non assumption on the, on the sources. But it doesn't matter at all which distribution it is, or yeah. So actually, uh, so the non-Gaussianity assumption is in the linear case. So in the in the in the non-linear case, when we have the temporal structures like autocorrelations or non-stationarity, then we uh, non-Gaussianity doesn't actually make much sense anymore because it's only talking about you know the marginal distribution. While now we are the whole focus is on the temporal structure. Uh, but it is true, yes, of course, there will be some, there will be some PDFs 
basically something like you know joint PDFs of uh, of, uh, of, of of time windows or something like that. And um, yeah, um, well, this this is yeah this is an interesting question. So in the self-supervised methods, in fact, you will learn such distributions completely automatically. Uh, I mean, you will learn the network will learn nonlinearities that model those distributions automatically. So you don't, have, in principle, you don't need to worry about that. In the maximum likelihood cases, like in the IVAE, it is actually a bit more difficult. You would need to develop some kind of a model of the distributions. Uh, in the IVA case, it's a model of the conditional distribution of the latent variables given the auxiliary variable. And that actually can give you some headache. Yes. Uh, in fact, what we have been using so far is that is, is a Gaussian distribution, but conditionally Gaussian distribution, uh, because that's algebraically by far the simplest one. But yes, the, well, but, but fundamentally, yes, we need, to, we need to have a reasonable model of the distributions of the sources. But that can be learned as, we don't need to impose that, uh, kind of postulate that, we can learn that as part of the estimation process. Okay, thank you. I hope you still have a few minutes time, so Anna would still have a, a question. Well, I have time, yes. Great. Hi, okay, Anna. Uh, yeah. Hi, so I'm data analyst, so I'm using all this for practical purposes. That's why my question is. So um, let's say you have some unsupervised data. So you, 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 you want to extract knowledge from it. And you do, for example, K clustering and you see cluster them into groups. That's one way, or you do something else. But this self-supervised learning, what do you actually win when you do it in terms of extracting knowledge? You mean, uh, what do you get in addition to clustering or something? Yeah, for example, if I have unsupervised data, I can do something with them. But why should I use this self-supervised learning? What additional benefits it gives to me? Well, okay. Um, well, self-supervised learning, of course, it, it can do all kinds of things. Um, it's just like an algorithmic trick. So I, I think, well, um, if I may reformulate your question, it's more perhaps more that so uh, if you did like some analysis into components as opposed to clusters, what would be the benefit of computing the components where the components may be calculated in a linear way or a nonlinear way? Uh, maybe maybe that's what, what you mean, is it? Yeah, okay. and why independent component is better than principal component? Uh, well, uh, the independent components are better because they actually are identifiable. So they will they are they are actually the components that created your data. But okay, but actually it's an interesting question. So what is the utility of components as opposed to clustering? Uh, well, I suppose it depends very much on your data. In some cases, clustering might work fine. If but it, if your data is simply kind of a something that where where the data points belong uh, just can be grouped into certain groups. Uh, but then, so basically, then you would be uh, characterizing each data point by just like one one uh, index index number, like one, two, three, or something. That's the index of your cluster, uh, which is kind of a very uh, extremely simple uh, way of describing your data, and too poor in some cases, or too impoverished, I should say. Uh, now, with components, you actually get like num the values of many components for each data point. So maybe like five, you get like maybe like five quantities for each data point that then describe different dimensions of your data points. So that is clearly like a much more richer description of your data and therefore much more useful in, in many cases. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you so much, Apan, and thank you everyone for the for listening and for the good questions. And, and then we will see you again next week with during the next machine learning coffee. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you.